Um, and of course, because it's such a, a magnificent art school, uh, and of course, architects have always dreamed to be taken as seriously as that. Uh, so somehow, the idea of having an architecture class being just one more class and as many art classes is a much more interesting uh, idea. And I think so. What's interesting about Stable is it's kind of a film, uh, and maybe we don't know the result of the between art and architecture. Um, and anyway, they're out of sync because it's two years in one program and five in another. And so somehow the fact that art and architecture never really quite understand each other because time is almost as important as space, so if the art students are out of sync with the architecture students, this begins then the great dialogue of uh, what is architecture. Anyway. And, and we can come up, of course, with a very easy definition of what is an architect. And this is already making the architect different from the art students. The difference would be that the art students know what architecture is, and the architecture school students don't. Um, so, which means actually we should reverse it. We should have the art students with two years and the architecture students with five years. Uh, and I think I mean this quite seriously. I think that's exactly what an architect is. Um, if a human being knows what a building is and what to do with the building, the architect doesn't. For the architect, buildings are full of mystery and insecurity. And they basically are in love with buildings, and the word love works because that's the word you use when you don't understand. That you want to be with something or someone, and you can't imagine it in any other way, but you don't have any words to describe why, and you use the word love. So when I say architects love buildings, that means they want to be with them, they can't imagine not being with them, but they don't know why. So they do projects and discussions and exhibitions and lectures in order to understand why they are addicted to buildings. And this is not so complicated. Maybe a painter is somebody who doesn't know what painting is, so they spend their whole lives painting to try to understand what the hell this thing is that they uh, like. But I think it would be very important to understand that the beginning of the asymmetry between the artist and the architect it actually begins with the artist being kind of experts about what architecture is, and architecture students and architects knowing less. And in fact, if what I'm saying to you is true, and I'm afraid it is, you as an architect will know less and less where your sense of what the mystery is will grow with time, which is why architects don't retire, don't have a life, don't have weekends, um, tend to live with other architects, and so on and so on, because there is this hope that finally one will get to understand uh, what, what, what architecture is. Artists, on the other hand, you have to understand what architecture is, and it's almost impossible these days to be a successful uh, artist without your theory of architecture, even your architectural installations, your, con your, your, your sort of concept of the city, um, and, and even your own abilities. Um, so you have this very interesting situation that the people that think are supposedly experts in architecture actually don't have an insecure relationship to architecture, and the people who don't think about it, let's say for a moment, in theory, have a totally secure relationship to it. Uh, the concept of architecture is very, very stable within the art world and very unstable um, uh, within the architecture world. And I think that's interesting. I'm not suggesting that. So change, so I think this is why it's interesting for us to be here, because even if uh, the relationship with art is uh, unclear and dis discontinuous and weird and let's say dysfunctional. Uh, this is all act accurate to the world of the So it continues to be a laboratory, even in the way in which the architects don't sit with the artists in the Mensa. And I think the Mensas reveal everything. Um, if you want to know what state is, just have to sit in the Mensa for 24 hours. You have to do the full 24 hours because things get them uh, at all moments. Uh, the other thing about Stable is, of course, especially in the architecture class, it's a global school that it attracts people uh, from a very wide range, both as teachers and as students. So if there's this experiment going on here, which for us means what is architecture, um, that, that experiment should be carried out by young minds from many, many different uh, uh, places. So I'm, I'm coming to you from New York, but via uh, New Zealand, but before arriving here was through England and Turkey, uh, not, not because there's anything interesting about that, actually there's nothing interesting about that, that's just the basic sort of daily life of, of operating in our field, but there's no way for me to communicate to you what it means that I'm a New Zealander here, no way for you to make a decision about whether that's good for you or not, not good for you, maybe everything you will know about New Zealand you will get from me, therefore you can uh, uh, believe it, but my journey to be with you in this room was not simple. <coughs> Uh, and your journey to be in this room will not simply be there. So we choose for a moment to be in this room 
a room that we don't necessarily need to be in because in the age of the global media and so on, we probably anyway, somebody's maybe taking this. So we really don't have to be in this room. You're making this huge nostalgic mistake that you should be in this room with me and that somehow being together in this room with me in Frankfurt on this beautiful day. By the way, it's a huge mistake on a beautiful day. This would be a great moment to be on the mind, which is just uh, there. So why do you make all of those uh, mistakes uh, uh, tonight? And I have to show you after an hour so it was even big mistake. But then you think, why do you make this journey? Right? And my main point would be, in fact my only point would be, you never learn anything when you make a journey. Not one thing. So this is a complete disaster at see. The only thing you could learn is that it's a disaster. Uh, for a start, there's no such thing as a simple journey. Like if I go from here to the mine, I do this with my hand uh, to the mine, from this place A to that place B, it would seem to be a, a simple journey. You might even imagine it's five minutes, something like that. You start to see what you might be imagining on either side, but actually no journey ever goes from A to B. Um, the whole point of going from A to B, like to the mine, is to change yourself. Uh, you would be different if you were there. There would be more to the sun, maybe you'd have a everybody on the you know, you become something new, you become anything, you change. So you go there to change. If you go there from A to B and know to change, then actually uh, traveling to B changes A. Right? If I go to Miami and have a good beer, it will change somehow the status of this place that I live. It's not this place I come back to as A, I will actually come back as a, especially if I have a head present, I come back to and if I have the hypervisor, I come back and this room seems different. Not just because I don't see things differently, but because, but because I made the journey. So the whole point of going to A to B is if I go to A to B, A will not be the same. So the journey is actually not from A to B, but is from here to another here that's different from the one now. In other words, I journey not to find something there, but to find something here. No, the whole point of the journey is that traveling to B changes A, so the journey from A to B can never be just simply from A to B, because when you reach B, A is no longer A, and even stranger enough still, just the thought of that experience already changes A. In other words, I just told you, you could have been in the, in the mine, so now your sense of stupidity is deeper, so now your experience of this room is different, so A is not A anymore, simply because we thought about what that journey would be, and in, my, in our minds together, I made you drink a beer in that journey, and even if you don't feel like a beer now, you were forced by me to drink it because I talked about what it would be for you to drink it and then return. In other words, together we imagined what a journey to the mind would be coming back here, but you didn't leave yet, but you have actually made that journey. Now, were you to now make that journey, in other words, we all decide, let's go and go to the mine, and I make the Hefeweizen. Even the Hefeweizen is not exactly the Hefeweizen you thought you were going to have because now the Hefeweizen has its meaning by virtue of the fact that by drinking it, A, coming back here will be different. So actually, you can't even drink the Hefeweizen anymore in the same way that you would if you'd gone without me because I've changed this, right? And you might say, well, why is he telling me all these things? Which are more or less obvious, but they're also very, very strange because what, one of the consequences of this is that since the thought of the journey, of the experience, already changes A, already has the effect of the journey, that when you actually make a journey, the journey has already happened. Right? And you must have had that experience that you could actually go to the mine and drink the beer and actually sort of come back here and, and almost forget that it happened. It almost didn't happen because it was so much the same as what it was meant to be. So journeys from A to B are never simply from A to B, and anyway they're always a repetition, they're always a rehearsal of something that already happened before, which means that every journey is an echo. You, it's a kind of vibration. Actually, uh, the mind, or your image of the mind, or the image that I'm giving you of the mind, and here are not separate places. It's the same, right? There is a mind produced here in A, which we think of as being outside A, but because it's produced here, it actually belongs here in this room, not out there, right? And the more I talk about it, the more I could prevent you from having an experience of the mind outside of A. And maybe since you're architecture students, it's impossible for you to have any experience of Frankfurt, which is not somehow inside Stadel, right? There's no outside Stadel, which is why you never go out, which is why students, for example, that were taken by Beatrice to the design museum, which is closer than the mine, you never made that journey before because there's no outside to Stadel. Right? Stadel is your big A, 
your big S. Right? I'm sorry, the tragedy is not just deciding to be with, here with me in the room. The tragedy is to be in Stadel or in school or in a place, in a place which is powerful at generating images, images which would change the possibility of any kind of journey that you would ever make. But were you to make a journey, that journey would be like an oscillation or a vibration along a line rather than going from A to B. Right? So a journey is not a linear movement from one place to another, but a kind of vibration between two uh, images, and the second image is actually inside uh, the first image. Now this super basic strangeness of all journeys is very important to remember when thinking about the structure of the architect's journey. Uh, in fact, architecture might be nothing more than turning the strangeness of all journeys into a kind of an art form. Uh, you know, when, you, when you're listening to architects, um, like as you heard from me, they always talk about their travel. Huh? I said I came from New Zealand, I went there, I'm from New York, but then I was England, then I was Turkey, then I was here. This is architects are always doing this, they're always talking about travel. Architects are always on the move, restlessly on the move. As you know, the medieval masons used to rove up and down Europe, hoping that somebody's uh, tower would fall down, and then they would arrive and say, of course, because you didn't do, use Jean de Blum from uh, Strasbourg, of course your tower fell down. Right, so always on the, uh, 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 on the move with quite a good publicity department. There's an incredible network of the so-called secret masons, which was not at all a secret. And the names of most of the masons are written on the floor of cathedrals as you walk in. They are not the innocent people you want. Uh, if there was Facebook, there was no doubt they would have been uh, uh, using it. Uh, every presentation by every architect involves some kind of story about a journey. It actually, actually would be an interesting test. Could you, could you present an architectural project without some discussion of some kind of uh, journey? But in architecture, you never will really hear a celebration of foreignness in architecture. You will never hear a discourse about how great it is that the world is stranger than what we could know and that were you to go to another place, there are things that you can't even experience because they somehow fall outside of your uh, habits. There's no passionate embrace in architecture of leaving your familiar world behind, uh, having all of your assumptions challenged by some sort of encounter with the other that is beyond your capacity even to uh, describe. There's a quiet but incredibly relentless celebration of the local that lurks behind all of the talk by even the most global of architects, right? So the big global architects and even the ones that talk about globalization really in the end uh, talk about the local. In fact, the very reason for hiring a globe-trotting designer, the reason for inviting them in is because they have this special ability to tune into the local. I'm sure when Norman Foster made his tower for Frankfurt, he was making some kind of discourse about the specifically uh, local condition of Frankfurt, even if that was a local condition of money, which in a, in, in a sense, in Frankfurt, money is a kind of a weather system. And he inserts his uh, building into that weather system. The globetrotting designer is supposed to be able to see in the local what the locals can't see because they are so local. It is as if the visitor, and only the visitor, can tell you what your home is. Your visitor comes in and says, that's very strange furniture that you have. And for the first time you think, well, well, maybe there is something Frankfurt about my furniture. So the visitor can not only tell you what your home is, the visitor can also tell you what your home might be in the future. You know, your furniture is typical Frankfurt. You know, it's got this kind of quality. Maybe, maybe we could suggest a different uh, furniture for you. Now it gets even worse. The very idea of the local, I just described the local if it, as, as if it's something that could be seen by the foreigner, but the very idea of the local already requires the foreign. In fact, the word local implies that you came back from some sort of a journey. Uh, a, a, a local means a return to something that was there before the journey, supposedly, but was never experienced as such. I leave home. And when I come back, I see my home for what it is. I see it as my local situation. I couldn't see it as local uh, unt until I uh, uh, leave. Uh, this means, by the way, that there's no such thing as a local architect. It's a complete contradiction in terms because architects are travelers and have always been traveler. And you could say an architect, somebody who doesn't know what a building is, is already a, a stranger at home. Uh, you can see that because architects, when walking the streets, have their heads up like tourists. Right? Whereas people who are living in a city have their heads down. They're just living in it and using the city. For us, it's, everything is marvelous, full of complexity and, de and detail. Right? Uh, so the architect is somebody for whom the everyday is foreign and excitingly foreign. 
That's what it means to say, I love architecture and I don't know what it is. It's like a mystery. It's like traveling to another world. Right? Waking up in the morning for the architect is like going on a, on a, on a, on a journey already. Uh, Homer, for example, tells us, Homer of the, of the epics, tells us that Daedalus, the founder of Greek architecture, actually imported his design ideas from Egypt. So even when you get back to Greek architecture, so much privileged as the beginning of so-called Western architecture, that beginning point is understood as somebody who traveled and took ideas from somewhere else. The architect is always a tourist. And this is not simply by traveling constantly, because it, the, the, the architect is a tourist because their basic role is to make the built environment visible, to allow, allow you to see your own world, to make the local appear as such. And you can only make, and this is the strange thing, you can only make the local visible by changing it. Right? So an outsider is called into the insider, inside because only the outsider can see the inside, but the inside can only be seen for itself and as itself by changing it. It has to become a super version of itself. It has to, as it were, not only sing a local song, but sing it in a way that identifies it as a local song, which is actually means it has to be not the local song, because the local song, nobody can see it. It's so local. Right? The air that you breathe is entirely invisible to you, not simply because it's transparent, but because there's no uh, uh, hesitation uh, uh, in its rhythm. Were you to have difficulty breathing, you would become very, very palpably physically aware of air in all of its movements and motions. Right? So in order for it to appear as such, it has to be something other than as such. That, of course, seems easy to say with the air, but it's true of everything else. Everything. So the paradox is, and I really apologize for saying these things, but I'll try to prove you later that these are obvious. The paradox is that the local only can appear as something other than itself. When you see something and you say, that's local, like I'm having the local cheese, actually that local cheese can't be local. It has to have something, it has to have changed in some way so that it can not only be local, but represent the fact that it's local. It has this extra responsibility. To make an, ob an object visible as such, in other words, for an architect to let you see your world, to expose something about your world. Remember, architecture is articulate building, building that talks about itself. For a building to talk to you, it is already not what it was before. Right? It has changed. It can say, I am local, I have these qualities, but the moment it says those things, it's no longer local. So the architect, in making the world visible, simply in letting you see your world, makes objects travel. Because in order to be local, they have to appear to have to be something other than what they were before. So the outsider makes an object move, and it moves in a way that lets it say, I had never moved, I was always here. Right? It's incredibly uh, bizarre. Or to say it another way, the architect gives a sense of mobility to the stationary environment. And I don't mean like, you know, flow or, you know, f the futurism or anything like that. No, just an object that appears to you as such. You see it. It is no longer doing what it was doing before. It has started to move. So, for example, um, Human beings know what a bathroom is. They go in, they use it, they come out. They have a very clear understanding of what it is. I would include artists in the category of human beings. Right? Architects have no idea what to do in a bathroom. For them, a bathroom is full of all sorts of complex statements about uh, modernity. Um, take a doorknob. Right? For a human being, a doorknob is a way from, of getting from one room to the next. For the architect, the doorknob is the handshake with the building. The doorknob is the beginning of the next room. Does the doorknob belong in this room or the next room? In order for me to go from this room to the next room, I have to understand that that doorknob would connect me to the other room. It's therefore part of the other room. So it's actually a piece of the next room intruding into this space, welcoming me in. The tactile grip, when I hold the handle, I'm holding the building. It is maybe the only time I hold the building. Most of the time, we are very careful not to touch architecture. So for the architect, the doorknob is an object of extraordinary mystery. We would ha easily have a conference at Stadel on doorknobs. It would go the whole weekend. It would be full of amazing architects and tourists. There'd be a history of doorknobs, be the technology of doorknobs, the whole question of the door, and what is a knob, and so on. How does the doorknob relate to the fact that now we no longer move a switch or even push a button but stroke a surface? What happened then to the door? We would never stop talking about it. But people who who make doorknobs, have a life, go home for the weekend, have, you know, they, they live. They don't, they're not obsessed by it. So again, for us, we can make a doorknob move, not because it's moving like this, but because it's become visible to, it, to us as a doorknob. If I can make a human being see a doorknob, 
For example, if I do a Bauhaus, Walter Gropius doorknob, it, they were seen. People would, could say to themselves, that's a doorknob, and by seeing it, it moved. In other words, the simple act of exposing the environment as the environment makes the environment something else, something other, makes it, puts it onto the move. So it's not simply that the architect travels, but the architect has the ability to produce the effect of travel, the effect of, of uh, uh, movement, or to say it yet another way, the great gift of the architect is to produce a sense of departure even when at home. Like if I ask an architect to make my house, yes, my house is in the same suburban street as all my neighbors, but now it's an architect's house, it's architecture, it's somehow not just in my street, it's also somewhere else. And this, of course, is exactly why architects walk through cities with their, with their heads up. I mean, for architects, everyday life is simply foreign. It's, it's full of fascinating surprises and so on. The very decision to be an architect is already to leave one's environment by simply starting to see it. In other words, that moment that an architect sees a building and says, I'm in love, they have left this around. Let's be even more precise then. What is the role of the architect? The art of the architect is to graph, graft the foreign onto and into the local. That is to say, I bring something from the outside and graft it into the inside in such a way that it's part of the inside and part of the inside being able to represent itself as, as inside. Architecture, to say it another way, is, the gra is a form of grafting in which an object speaks for the environment it is inserted, to, inserted into, producing the effect of the local, but you can only have the effect of the local with something foreign. The local as such is precisely that which does not represent itself. It is as if, the, as if the import, the foreign element, actually acts as the host for the local rather than the local hosting the visitor. In other words, the local is not just sitting there, a little bit stupid, a little bit provincial, doesn't have anything to say, and coming from the outside is the great gift of the foreign, the great, the great, the great addition of the foreign. Actually, local is born in the grafting uh, of the foreign. So the foreign is actually the host uh, uh, rather than uh, 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 the local. In other words, to summarize, the addition of the foreign makes something more like itself than it was before. Now this sounds a little bit too tricky and a little bit too much uh, uh, from a fortune cookie or from some very bad 1960 book on motorcycle maintenance, uh, but think about it. It's not so tricky. I don't know if it's the same for you, but I'm simply not myself until I have my cup of coffee in the morning. I'm really not myself. It's not like I'm less than myself or a cranky version of myself. I'm simply not myself. But after having that coffee, I am myself. I feel myself for the first time. In other words, I add something from the outside, caffeine, but a very particular kind of caffeine, in order that I can be and feel myself. Which, of course, raises the question of who is it that wakes up? Now, whoever wakes up in the morning, well, firstly, I didn't wake up, which is why I need the coffee. So who is it is almost woken up? It's not me, but let's say a proto-me or a potential for me, a potential that's realized when I take something from the outside. And by the way, if you don't take things from the outside, you die, right? So if you have this sort of sense that uh, I don't need the outside in order to be me, I'm just fine as me, uh, s just give it a test, you know, stop eating for a week. Right? You are what you are by what you bring into yourself and what you synthesize to yourself and what you graft yourself. And would you, describe, would you describe pieces of your body as truly belonging to you or to the world, the energy flow that you brought in in order to construct yourself? And anyway, do you think of your stomach as inside your body or as part of the outside world that's inside your body? Right? Do I bring a steak? Now I'm revealing my uh, thoughts. If I bring a steak inside me, did I bring it inside me, or is it that my stomach is a part of the outside world which then filters the steak into me so that the line between inside is not here at the mouth or at the rear, but inside me in the middle? From a kind of medical point of view, it's inside, right? The, the digestive system is the outside environment passing right through your body with a series of filters that can pull from that the nutrients you need. So when I eat the steak, it's not when I put it in my mouth, but when I absorb the vitamins from it through the membranes, uh, of the lining of my system. In other words, I become myself by grafting the outside into, into the inside in order to define myself. It's super simple. Most people have the same relationship to clothing, by the way, that they are not themselves until they wear the kinds of clothes that are truly them, which is why when you're shopping for clothes, people say to you, no, no, that's not you. Or you put on a sweater that you think is poopy, say, that's really me. Well, no, I mean, or yes, right? And if, and if, and as, if as anybody who's depressed, the most obvious and simple and effective form of therapy is to go shopping, 
You go shopping for a new you. you don't, it's not you that's shopping looking for a sweater. You're looking to rebuild yourself by adding to yourself something that's not with you and ought to be the new you that you want to be. Right? And then you say, I'm absolutely me. In fact, I might have a sweater that I so much feel is part of my life that were I to lose it, I would grieve deeply. You, we, we all have those kinds of relationships. Why wouldn't architecture be the same as the coffee and the clothes that you wear? So I give you, I'm going to give you one example to try to prove that this is the age-old story. And it's this example. I could have asked you to draw this building without showing you this slide. And I think you, most, of it, most of you would have done a reasonably accurate drawing, or at least a drawing that would be sufficiently accurate to capt capture this uh, uh, concept. Of course, this is the Sydney Opera House. Sydney is, a, is in Australia, of course. But for most of you, you probably only know of Australia as the sort of massive continent that comes out of the rear end of this building. This is sort of like a... This is sort of like an Australia producing machine because you can't even imagine Australia without this object because it's sitting there uh, in Sydney Harbour which is the space of import and export and you could ask yourself are they importing this or exporting this? Is this a piece of Australia that's heading it's on its way towards us or is it a piece of the outside world coming in? You can see of course that it sits on a kind of a strong heavy plinth that seems to belong to the land. And then it has a series of shells above that seem to belong to the air. And so the classic interpretation of this building is that it's the land and the sky kind of pulling apart. But you have to look a little bit more closely. I mean, if this belongs to the land, is this floating or not? And you would say to yourself, no, 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 it's not floating because that's very, very heavy. There's no way it could float. But what you're actually looking at is an image of something floating. It's as if the whole thing is uh, 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 on the move. And how solid do you think this concrete is? Like, are we looking at a solid lump, or, or is this inside a, a kind of a void? You actually have no idea, but you work on this kind of uh, 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 image. It, of course, it's a dramatically foreign object in the sense that there's nothing like that anywhere in Australia, but actually you can't think of Australia, you can't even think of Sydney Harbour without this object. Were this object to disappear, you would still see it uh, and you would miss it. This object is forever suspended between the foreign and the local. It's impossible for you to make a decision if this is foreign uh, uh, or local. 1956 was the competition for the Sydney Opera House. Utzon wins it in January of 1957, but the project took 16 years to build, the architect having resigned uh, 10 years earlier. In other words, when he wins the competition, Utzon is 38 years old, which is, for architects, still officially young. Right? He's officially a young architect. Five years after winning the competition, Utzon published his only extended account of the design in a text called Platforms and Plateaus, Ideas of a Danish Architect. It's great when architects tell you when the idea is coming, like, warning, here is the idea. Here is the idea. Published in Zodiac magazine in, in Milan. And I want to argue to you that this essay is a tour de force of architectural persuasion. In other words, five years after he makes this enormous object, he tells us what is the idea that produced the object. The article begins with the combination of his photographs and a series of his sketches of pre-Columbian temples in Mexico where he says he, quote, fell in love with the idea of platforms. Again, be careful of falling in love. That means, of course, he is in love with the platform, doesn't know what the platform is, so tries to understand what it is with photographs and sketches. During a 1949 study trip, so the architect is somebody who travels, who studies, who falls in love with things, and tries to analyze them. He describes this as an architectural trick that, quote, completely changed the landscape simply by creating a new vantage point above the tree line. In other words, they make a platform, which is when you get to the top of the platform, you're higher than the trees around. And because you're higher than the trees around, suddenly you can see the horizon, which you could never see before. So you spend your whole life in amongst the trees, and then suddenly you see this. He says, this, quote, converted the site by placing people between the land and the sky. So the role of architecture here is to position the human body between the land and the sky, and your whole world changes. In fact, he says it converts the site into something, quote, even stronger than nature, more than that, he says, a whole new planet. And this is classic architect speak. You, 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 you make an object that lets you see your world for the first time, and in seeing your world for the first time, you live in a different planet. It's not that you see the world better, that you have just a clear vision. It's that because you can see, you have traveled, you have gone uh, uh, to a whole new planet. In between these two um, examples, by the way, so one is um, 
One is like this, where, where you can see the tree line and the clouds and the platform is lifted up. And then the second example is that you're on the top of a mountain and you have to cut the top of the mountain off to produce the same effect. So the one is a ready-made, there's already a mountain giving you the view, and the other is one where you have to make an, an artificial mountain. In between these two Mexico sites, he shows the same principle in India, China, Japan, Greece, and the Middle East, so pretty much everywhere in the world. And he concludes with two very short paragraphs on the Sydney Opera House. In other words, this article, which is, gives the only clear explanation of the theory of this building, <coughs> spends only two paragraphs on the Sydney Opera House, despite the fact that there's not a single person who's written about this Sydney Opera House project who does not quote those two paragraphs. Right? And everything that leads up to those two paragraphs is the traveling architect learning the concept of the platforms. Then we see it, of course, in, in uh, China and Japan. And then he does these three drawings, first of clouds over water, then the clouds turn into sort of shell forms, then the shell forms become more like the roof of, of an auditorium, and the platform has started to become rippled, and people are now inserted between the land and the sky. And then we go to the next page and we see the models of exactly that rippling platform with the people, which gives way to images of the model showing the people poised here between the platform and the sky, with the shells representing the air, and the platform being the key part of the project. And then we see the actual project under construction. So it could not be more kind of architects lecture 101. I went to the site, I saw a concept, I drew this concept, I sketched the concept, I absorbed it into my body, my superior brain brought it back to my office. I thought about this project, I had the same idea, I developed that idea which I found in Mexico, I developed it for Sydney, especially for Sydney, a Sydney edition of the Mexico concept, uh, a concept of inventing new planets. I, the humble 38-year-old architect, will bring Australia a whole new planet by giving them a new platform to see. Uh, from that idea I made drawings, from those drawings I made models, from those models I made this enormous platform in the Sydney Harbour. The most delicate of travel sketches, the light pencil used in the early images has now given way. I mean, basically, it's a transition from that light sketch trying to capture the idea of the platform through to this enormous platform in the harbour. This is understood to be the same drawing, and again, we get a light sketch which returns, capturing the point that the end result is the same as the starting result, that he absorbed the magical local condition of the Mexican example, and then was able to take it to his studio and then present it in a reformed uh, version here uh, uh, in, the, in the Opera House. Uh, in fact, he argues that he does a whole lot of so-called plateau po projects based on all of his journeys and, and all of his work will be in these kind of plateaus. And not by uh, ex accident, the first page of the article shows him driving a car, explaining you know, platforms and so on, the idea of the Danish architect. And look at the way he drives. Firstly, he's the 38-year-old, he has his right hand on the wheel, he's the driver, we are in the back seat, we are being driven by the architect, whoever is the architect, they're in front. Uh, the left hand doesn't need to drive, it lifts up and the fingers catch the light magically and he's turning to us saying basically what you're about to see will be, uh, effectively he's saying what you're about to see is this beautiful trip that I took in Mexico and this is what I saw. So here we have the uber classic narrative going from travel photograph sketches, diagrammatic principles to model to detailed drawing to the building itself such that the Sydney Opera House and even the harbour itself will now be more like itself than it was before with the addition of this horizontal platform which lifts people up from the peninsula. In other words, what he's offering Sydney is not just a beautiful object for them, he's offering them their own harbour. He's saying, I'm going to give you your harbour by giving you an optical mechanism with which you will see the harbour and only in that moment will you be Australian. Right? This is the moment that you will be Australia because you will see Australia for the first uh, time. The visitors, and there can only be visitors to such a project, even the citizens of Sydney will be turned into tourists, and this is, of course is the reversed effect. If the architect is, that, is always a tourist and always is able to give objects the sense of travel, one of the effects of architecture is to make the people who experience it into tourists, like it's a tourist production uh, uh, machine. The tourists will occupy the gap between the solid plane, uh, the massive concrete platform, and the light clouds. They will be between the land and the sky, and they will, like the Mexicans in Yucatan, experience a radically transformed world. In other words, the Opera House is Australian, 
not by virtue of any Australian characteristics. There's nothing in it that, that you could identify with Australia, but it's Australian because it's an optical instrument that reveals Australia to Australians, allowing them to be Australians and therefore Australia to be Australia for the first time. So what did the 38-year-old architect design? Australia, right? And I can tell you, if you, if you enter a competition and everybody else is putting up opera houses and you're putting up Australia, you're gonna win, right? It's a pretty good trick. Or, so the story goes, and not a single critic has ever failed to repeat this story, endlessly republishing the, the sketches from the 1962 text, never even saying to themselves, but wait a minute, these sketches were done five years after the competition was uh, uh, won. By the way, the year before he published this article in 1961, Utzon published a, a much lesser known and very, very angry essay on a Stockholm University project that also describes the development of his plateau projects. And the reason he does that is that somebody from his office has won a competition using a concept that he believes to be his own, the concept of the platforms. So he's busy arguing that he and only he uh, has this concept. And he again rehearses that his narrative about the architect as a sensitive traveler that can tune into local conditions, inserting something foreign that allows the local to see more than what was seen before which he says, quote, which has been achieved through hard and difficult work, as well as through the experiences of my journeys, some of which were in Mexico, India, and China. In other words, the reason we should trust him, the reason we should go with him, is that he is so experienced in architectural journeys. And he argues that the work has, his own work has been stolen by the winner. Interestingly, the young guy from his office totally agrees with him and says, yes, I did steal it from you but you stole it from Frank Lloyd Wright, Le Corbusier, Niemeyer, and Elto. Um, so who cares? So of course, Utzon has to walk a really fine line between two competing claims. One, that what he finds in his journeys is a fundamental principle shared by all ancient cultures, and then he has to claim also that only he has been able to truly recognize what that principle is and to modify it and make original work out of it. In other words, the difference between himself and the person who works for him is that he has the unique ability to transform and to continue the ancient tradition. Now, of course, what is really most interesting about this story is that when Utzon did the Opera House, he'd actually not been to most of the places he was talking about. He had indeed been to Mexico in 1949, but he had not visited Asia and India, Japan, the Middle East, or Greece, any of his other examples. In other words, somebody who says that you can only experience this fundamental reality by making a trip in order to experience the local conditions actually never made any of those trips, but reassures us that those principles are fully operating in those spaces. And if he didn't need to visit India, Asia, Japan, Middle East, or Greece in order to locate this point, then he didn't need to go to Mexico either, of course. Uh, actually, he'd never been to the site in Australia. So the man who makes the most uh, amazing, the, the, the project that allows Australia to be Australia, never went to Australia. In fact, his whole discourse about sensitivity to local conditions is actually a discourse about the fact that the very same idea could be imported to any site. In other words, if you analyze his discourse, he's saying the idea of the platform can be used anywhere. So it's actually not about the specificity of Australia, but about the generality, uh, uh, the global condition uh, of the basic idea. Uh, what did he know about the site? These are the photographs that appeared in the original competition brief. You see the peninsula with the original um, building on it for the trams. These are the different sites that the jury for the competition considered before they chose the one at the top on the peninsula. Why did they choose this site on the peninsula? They said because such a harbour setting would at the same time be characteristic of Sydney and provide a landmark for travellers as memorable as the Stockholm Town Hall or the Doge's Palace in Venice. In other words, exactly what they love about this site is it could be an opportunity to have a building just like in Stockholm or just like in Venice. In other words, they're inviting not for they're inviting foreign architects to bring not the local situation, but to echo something that has already happened. In other words, what's an advantage of the peninsula is you could do in Australia exactly what has been done in other places. Um, now, of course, this is a very complicated play between the local and, and, and the global. Utzon had no idea what Australia was like, so he went to the Australian embassy in Copenhagen and sat down and watched a publicity film which was trying to persuade people to travel to Australia. And in this film, he said he saw some very beautiful clouds. And when he saw those clouds, he said he knew what he needed to do, that he had to respond to those clouds. But more than that, 
he thought, he thought that the site was very similar to the peninsula which projects in, into the strait which separates Denmark and Sweden. In other words, what he saw in Australia was the peninsula that was very close to where he was coming from. In fact, he treated the site in Australia as a variation of his own local situation. In fact, he saw this site as his hometown. He said, I had no difficulty in visualizing Benelong Point, which is this point in Australia, um, he had no difficulty in visualizing this site. Um, he said, because we have the castle of Helsinger on the point, just like your tram depot on Fort Macquarie. So anybody, anybody who looks at that building and says that it reminds you of one of the most famous castles in Europe, again, is going to win over the Australian heart. Because of course, it's, it's, of course it's quite, uh, quite elegant uh, tram building. But he looks at this and says, sees his own castle. In other words, he recognizes his own home in Australia and enters the competition with a hometown advantage because he's designing for his own home, not for Australia. He has a hometown advantage on a site that he's never been to, in a country he's never been to, in a hemisphere he could not even imagine. On the basis of a, of a publicity film and some photographs, he was able to dream that in Sydney he could be a visitor to his own home. Right? Amazing. Uh, so for him, going to Sydney would not be a journey away from Denmark would be a return. It would be to sort of see home. Uh, and so, of course, he did the competition and put in his entries. There is the building that he sees as being like a castle. And here are all, the, all of the entries. There were um, many entries sent in from 233 people from more than 30 countries. Of course, you know, the local architects really tried to stop the foreigners from entering. They really, really argued for that very strongly, but it didn't really work out because the prime minister himself was a second generation immigrant and all of those architects that were um, uh, complaining and saying we shouldn't have any foreign architects were refugees from the Second World War from Europe. So a group of European architects resident in Australia protested the idea of having quote unquote foreign architects coming in to a prime minister who was himself second generation. He said, forget about it. So in this mountain uh, uh, of images, Utzon sent these very, very light line drawings, like unbelievably restrained. Everybody else was sending in uh, um, enormous uh, uh, stuff, and he was just sending these very elegant, thin drawings. All except for one drawing, you see the kind of quality of them, very sort of restrained, very kind of measured, except for this drawing, in which he shows that the undersides of the vaults uh, will be colored gold. But not just colored gold, the drawing is actually gold. It's gold leaf. So basically you're turning these very, very restrained, quiet, analytical images and suddenly you, the image is vibrating with gold. Anybody that thinks that Utzon is some sort of naive 38-year-old who just accidentally wins this competition because he was lucky has to consider what it means to have thought that in a set of 12 drawings you'll have one drawing made of gold leaf, right? Uh, like this. Then he has one drawing and this is the only explanation. See almost the scientific quality uh, uh, of the typeface. And in the short text he says, this project, quote, emphasizes the character of the site. This is what every architect says. You will, for every project you ever do, say that your project emphasizes the site. You will never hear an architect saying, basically, I tried to reject the site. Right? You all say you tried to emphasize it. But then you will also all do a second move, which he, say, he says, yet the building is in clear contrast with all the buildings around it. In other words, I worship the site, and yet I'm different from the site. It's like advertising, innocent yet sensual, bold yet modest, uh, local yet global, right? Perfect, dream scenario, right? Absolutely dream scenario. So the jury, and here is the jury, uh, and you could, you, could, you could see that at that moment in time, the really crucial element is a pipe. If you don't, if you don't have a pipe, uh, you're in real trouble. You can see the guy on the left, he's totally annoyed because he doesn't have a pipe. And the other <laughs> side, um, And the jury is, is itself exactly half local and half foreign. You have uh, Ashford and Parks representing Australia, and you have Leslie Mark and Martin uh, uh, on the right representing England, and Eris Saarinen, you see, holding the glasses. He has not only a pipe, but glasses. It's clear that he's the winner. It's also clear that he's the one uh, at the center. In the image, it would appear that this guy, wants to talk, and this guy wants to talk, but it's Saarinen that's winning. 
It's very, very clear. The photographer understands who is at the center of the image. And again, if you imagine that juries review competitions and then accidentally get photographed uh, making uh, uh, discussions, uh, it's absolutely not true. For example, uh, Saarinen arrived five days late for the jury because he was on holiday with his wife in Fiji, and he just turned up a little bit late. And it, so it goes that, that, that uh, Utzon's image had already been rejected. And it had been rejected because, there, amongst other things, there was no perspective. Everybody was required to do a perspective. And one of the reasons it was thrown out is not simply that it didn't have a perspective, but they didn't know what it would look like. Nobody knew what it would look like. There's no drawing that shows what it would look like. So, of course, Saarinen not only pulled it out of the garbage and said, this is the winner, but he went to his hotel room and drew, did the perspectives. So, Saarinen, this is one of them, and this is the other. He did these in the hotel room, took them back the following day, showed the jury these images, and they said, oh, it's beautiful. And of course, so what Saarinen is saying is, this is what Utzon was really doing. Of course, it's Saarinen doing it. So here, here you have a juror from the outside seeing a project that potentially, this is just in the moment he's thinking about TWA, right? So you, under, you understand that he, so he, he sees, and again, it's not clear who's influencing who, right? Whether he's uh, falling in love with the project of Utzon because Utzon is doing something with shells that he would like to do soon afterwards, or whether it's the other way around, right? that somehow there's this reaction. But he does these drawings, and of course the jury decides that indeed he's right, and then they get photographed, and again, remember, now you see that it's, it's of course, we've, we have, I've sort of uh, flipped the images, but you see it's, a, it's another photograph of the same group uh, with the same sort of seriousness. So there are about 20 images of them concentrating on which drawing? The gold drawing, right? The magical gold drawing. And it's the only drawing that, that, that Utzon provides that gives you a sense of perspective. It shows people between the ground uh, 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 and, and the sky. Uh, by the way, uh, after Saarinen uh, made sure that Utzon was the winner, he traveled back to the United States, but did so via Indonesia, India, Rome, and London. Right? Just if you think uh, there's any confusion there. By the way, he thought that, um, he thought that um, uh, Utzon would not be able to do the project. So he insisted that Utzon should win, but then said, Utzon's too young to do it, so the only way Utzon can do it is if he partners up uh, with an engineer. By the way, uh, when, when, the, when the competition was published the following day in the newspaper, the image that appeared of it was done by another person. This is done by somebody working for the newspaper, because again, they didn't have an image. So the image that makes this project famous is an entirely different rendering of the project by an illustrator within the newspaper. And you see Utzon is photographed down below. Utzon had no idea until, until he had won, until this newspaper gave a call. Utzon was in the garden with his daughter, and he had told his daughter that if he wins the competition, she would get a horse. So basically, the, the, journal, the, journalist, the journalist calls and says, you have won the competition. And the kid immediately says, I want my horse. I want my horse. Um, and Utzon says, Utzon is totally surprised that he won. And he said he never expected to win. But the photographs of the, of the site in Australia had, quote, made him dream of home. And so in other words, he had to do this project. It was a domestic fantasy about his homeland that accidentally wins the foreign competition. But it was not until eight months after winning the competition that in July 1957, he travels to Australia for the first time. And now what's interesting is, is that uh, uh, Saarinen had said that there's no, no way the guy could do the project uh, uh, on, on his own. He has to do it with Ove Arup, who's an, who's an engineer, who, another, who had immigrated to London. So on his way back, Saarinen goes to London and organizes the meeting between Ove Arup and Utzon, and then they agree that they can work with each other. Utzon, who felt very infantilized by the idea that he must work with an engineer, decided that he quite liked Ove Arab. Ove Arab thought that he was a reasonable uh, guy. Unbeknownst to Saarinen, Ove Arab received exactly the same contract as Saarinen, uh, as, as Utzon. So as far as the Australian government was concerned, they were both in charge of the project. And this, this fact would ultimately lead uh, to a kind of uh, uh, disaster. When he finally travels down to Australia in 1957, here, July 1957, here we see them standing on the side. And you can see Utzon has a big smile on his face, and he's a tall guy, and everybody else around him looks not very well dressed. And one of the key propaganda features of the architect is to make other people feel insufficiently uh, dressed. But also, he stands there, and you see them all. They all look kind of stumpy and stocky, and he's sort of resplendent. His right hand, you see, is very loosely here. He's totally in control. He could use it, 
but he doesn't need to. His left hand softly, the same hand that rises, remember when he's driving the car, this hand, this sort of magic hand, rises up and he indicates where this masterpiece uh, will appear, like a man of, of, uh, uh, of magic. Um, the, 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 the local papers wrote more about how, what he looked like himself than about his project. Uh, the Woman's uh, Home Weekly said, the lanky Jorn Utzen is, uh, is a young uh, Gary Cooper, only better looking. Now, of course, <laughs> this is an interesting reference because Gary Cooper, of course, was the actor who played the architect in the Fountainhead. So in other words, they chose the actor whose beauty was chosen for the fountainhead and said, this guy looks even better. Throughout this trip, there's always a huge kind of smile on his face, like he's just endlessly uh, uh, happy. And he stands on the site here with Ashford, and he, which is his, his uh, partner, and, 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 the, and the other guys from the jury, and points to where his magic trick will happen and says this amazing thing. In this moment of the film, he says, this site is even more beautiful than in the photograph from which I worked. So the amazing thing about the site is that it's even more beautiful than a photograph. And he had brought with him, and you look at this. <laughs> this is a 38-year-old guy. He's never done anything in his life. He's down there in Australia, waving towards the site like everything beautiful would happen. See, nicely dressed, nice tie. By the way, the entire history of this project could be done as a micro-history of his ties. He brings, see, the crispness of his looks. He brings the model and they're opening it up. It's like the incubator for a baby or something there. He's, just, he's so tender, so tender. But look at his hands again. He's sort of like, he's in control. He's like saying, careful, and everybody else is looking more closely. And then he's explaining the magic features to the jury. And you see it like this. You notice that the model has a very different shape from the building because actually nobody, even Utzon, knew what the shape of this building uh, 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 would be. He says, uh, like this, Amazing kind of image, I leave for you to understand what he's really uh, doing, blowing the dust off it or whatever. Notice that, by the way, the platform already has this quality, this floating quality. So it's not simply the ground solid and the shells light and floating. Even the platform itself has some kind of floating uh, quality. Here he is with his partner, the architect, at the airport, and he says to everybody uh, on national television for Australians, he says, we felt, felt ourselves when we made this thing as Australians and as members of the new culture of our time. So in other words, the, the reason they win the competition, they already feel like Australians. And he says, he reassures the country that, quote, 18 months from now, we will be able to put down the foundation stone. So just oozing this kind of infinite confidence. It is on the way back from this trip to Australia, done six months after he wins the competition, that he finally, for the first time, visits Japan which will be used as one of his examples four and a half years later as, as the inspiration for his project. In Japan, he writes a letter back to the Australian government, to his client, and says, I have studied a lot in relationship to the Opera House in Japan, and I've had my ideas confirmed as to the shells, the detailing of the glass walls, and so on. In other words, the reason he goes to Japan is also to confirm that he's right, right? Um, as always, the architect's journey is not a journey of discovery, but a journey of confirmation, a rehearsal of something that has already taken place. Uh, six months later, he returns to Australia. By the way, that was his rhythm. Six, every six months, he would come down. He returns with this book, the so-called Red Book, and this in it has enough of the developed, developed design that they can sign the contracts. And the first image in this book is this kind of charcoal sketch. Uh, this soft charcoal sketch is followed by a series of very detailed drawings that would act as the basis for the contract. And it included photographs of the first model, the one you saw before, which was created after the competition, but already by that moment, that model was out of date, was, re was redundant. In fact, both the podium, the platform, you see the podium in, in, in black, and the, uh, 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 the shells, more or less in, in white, were highly problematic. In fact, nobody knew how to build the platform, it turned out that the platform had to be itself an engineering feat of enormous uh, strength, and then it was super unclear how the shells would work. So actually, the thing that seems to be the solid base, it was actually built as a bridge, a very beautiful bridge, so it's completely hollow on the, on the inside, and the shells themselves turned out to be extraordinarily heavy. So when you look at this, the heavy thing is the shells, and the light thing is actually uh, uh, the base. And they didn't know how to do it. Utzon was incredibly cunning and canny in being very ambiguous about the quality of the shells when they had absolutely no idea. 
When interviewed, he would not say, we have absolutely no idea. He would say, well, you know, he'd make gestures like this with the magic hands, and everybody would go like, ah, oh, you're such a nice guy. Uh, in April of 1958, that is to say two years after the competition begins, finally they figured out how to do the podium, right? Um, but they still didn't know t what to do with the, with, the, with the sails, with the shells. Maintaining his rhythm of six months between every visit, in November of 1958, he goes to China on his way back, and now for the first time he gets to China. So in other words, bit by bit, he starts to visit the places. After he wins the competition, he one by one visits all the places that five years after the competition, he will say are the basis for the uh, success of the project. Again in China, he writes back to the, his client and says, everything in China confirms that what we are doing is okay. <laughs> so, three or four thousand years of Chinese culture has worked itself up just so that this guy, this young architect, can go there and say, pretty good, right? Now, you can, can you imagine what he would have done if he'd gone there and for some reason the platform simply would not have been consistent with his theory. Well, it's impossible. He would not have seen that. You could show him a large piece of ice cream and he would say, I see the platform and I see the shells, right? When you, and don't think it's any different when you travel. You see what you were meant to see, what you decided to see. Uh, uh, you could not, as Jack Nicholson say, you don't want to know the truth, right? You certainly don't want to know the truth. Uh, once again, he makes his journey to China simply to confirm. By the way, this was already true of the first trip to Mexico in 1949 because Utzon had started to do platform projects five years before that. So Utzon starts doing platform projects and after five years, he heads off to Mexico and sees a platform. Right? And that's the only platform he's seen before he wins the competition. So even when he went to Mexico, it was to confirm an idea that he already had. By the way, the reason he went to Mexico to see the platforms is that his teacher Rasmussen had made a famous trip to China and done a series of sketch drawings and those sketch drawings were used by Utzon when he made a manifesto for architecture as a very young student. In other words, he goes to Mexico to confirm that his experience would be like the experience that Rasmussen had when he went to China and that he would do sketches similar to those that Rasmussen did. So the sketches that he did in Mexico were not even of the platforms, they're of Rasmussen. They're a kind of uh, honor, a, ma a marking of honor or a repetition uh, the assumption is that if his teacher went through that cycle, he should go through that cycle as well. It doesn't really matter when he did the cycle because he started to do platform projects five years before. So the guy's busy doing platform projects, heads off to Mexico to confirm that that's a good idea, good idea, uh, comes back, does the competition, wins the competition,